Hello, everyone, and welcome to week four of our diabetic friendly nutrition education series. Um, we are just letting people into the room right now. Um, so just give us a few minutes as we wait. All right, looks like everyone is in so far, so I'll get started. Um, my name is Micheline White. I am the executive director of Mendonoma Health Alliance. We are the ones um, providing this education series for the community, and you'll see more of these in the future. Um, I would like to introduce to everybody Jill Nusenow, who is our guest chef tonight. Jill is also um, a registered dietitian and has hosted numerous um, numerous shows for us in the past, both nutrition education um, from her registered dietitian background and also other cooking demonstrations. So um, we're happy to have Jill back again. For those of you who don't know, Jill is also referred to um, very popularly as the veggie queen, um, uses a lot of really great fresh ingredients in her cooking and um, has also taught at Santa Rosa Junior College um, in the culinary department and is um, very well established with a great following. I believe some of you guys are those followers who are joining us tonight. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Jill and she will be featuring tonight's special, which is Thanksgiving alternatives that are diabetic friendly and vegetarian. So Jill, over to you. Thank you very much, Micheline. I just remembered I, oh no, I got everything. Okay, so when I started to do this menu, I was like, oh, you know, you get a little sometimes over ambitious at the holidays and I feel like I did. So some of the things I have done in advance just to make myself not so scattered here and to get everything done. So I'm planning to do five recipes. Um, four of them are cooked and one of them isn't. And I already started one. And the one that I'm gonna start with is the creamy winter squash and apple soup. And I've done this, a similar soup with pear. I wanna show you the squash because I have pre-cooked it. And I know some people are like, oh, I don't wanna deal with squash because it's so hard to cut. So what I wanna show you is the other half of the squash this was a beautiful kabocha squash, like maybe about four pounds. And what I did is, and you can do this by giving it a poke and putting it in the microwave. I put this into the pressure cooker and I cooked it for nine minutes. And when I was done, I could stick the knife into it. And that, then I knew that it was cooked enough. So then what I did is I took the squash and I cut it up. And one of the nice things about kabocha, and I'll show you some other squash, is you can actually eat the peel on this squash. I did take it off. It's not that pretty. It's kind of green. But I have orange one over there, which would work really well. I have to say it's a very delicious squash. So I'm going to start with that. I already have in my pressure cooker, and you can easily do this on top of the stove. I already have some onion in there that I started cooking. And when I started cooking it, I uh, realized it was a very strong onion, and I thought I was going to get start this by cooking, which is not a good way to start. So I'm actually going to follow the recipe the best that I can. Um, it's not my forte. I write them, but I don't always follow them. Um, so I started with onion and two to three teaspoons of curry powder. And I want to just say curry powder is a blend of spices. So I already put in one teaspoon. I'm going to put in another. I'm not gonna put three, um, but every curry powder, this one tends to be a little hot. And so if your curry powder is hot, do you wanna take note of that? Or you can make your own curry powder. I have in one of my books, Vegan Under Pressure, I have how to make your own curry powder. Um, so I have the squash that I have cut up already. And this is gonna go in with um, an apple and it's just to peel it and dice it. But one of the things about apple is that um, if you leave the peel on, you will get um, you will get more fiber. So I'm going to leave the peel on, and it's just an apple. I'm going to put the whole apple in there. 
Um, I cut it in advance. I put it in some water with some lemon, but it still got a little bit brown, which is fine. Um, so I'm gonna put that in there. And here we go, the rest of the apple, the squash. And I'm gonna tell you this soup, unlike some of my other soups, gets coconut milk. You can use coconut water if you want, but I'm actually gonna start with the vegetable stock. So I made some stock today because I didn't have anything to do. Um, I make stock often. I'm gonna show you my little jar that has stock. This is three cups right there. So I need one more. Put this here for my assistant, who is me. Um, let me get the other cup in. So this is a two cup jar. So I'm gonna put not quite the whole thing. And then I'm going to put the squash in. If you don't have a pressure cooker, don't worry about it. You don't need to use a pressure cooker. I have done this on top of the stove. It works just great. So just pretend I'm here at all times. My elves did not show up today. So the thing I'm not going to put in is I'm not going to put coconut milk in and I'm just going to get this cooking. So I'm going to turn this off. And then what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, kind of look at my recipe. It says to cook it for four minutes at pressure. So I'm going to do that. And I am going to do it on natural release. Okay, and now I can forget about that. And the reason I'm not going to put the coconut milk in, and I want to show you the coconut milk, I have choices. I can use coconut water, which has no fat in it. I can use uh, a coconut milk in a container. This one is basically coconut cream, natural flavor, xanthan gum and salt. There's often xanthan gum in coconut milk. I can use a full fat coconut milk, this organic coconut milk. It is um, coconut milk, water, and that's it. So I can add either one of these. Sometimes coconut milk will curdle you are cooking, so I'm going to add it afterwards. And it calls for a cup and a half of co coconut milk. So I will just do that then. And I'm going to put it over here. So you're going to see me in and out of the frame. I apologize for that, but this is real life cooking and this is what sometimes happens. So I don't have to think about this for a while. I do want to get my lime. It's not the most beautiful lime and I do want to grate it. So I'm going to get a little microplane grater right here and I am going to just grate the lime. Now using zest of lemon and lime is a really good way to cut down on um, cut down on using salt and it adds a lot of flavor it has anti-cancer properties you know and it tastes good and you don't have to you know you can just use the outside and I'm going to add some lime juice to this and I want to show you because I'm going to be making a lemon scented spinach spread and that I used uh, lemon and it's fascinating what happened. Um, I couldn't believe it. This is the zest of one lemon. It was a very large lemon, but it is a lot of zest. I mean, this is like, you know, more than two tablespoons. And I used my zester for that. And I love the zester as a tool. And it's really fascinating to see what happens with it. So I think I'll give you a little zest show here. Always make sure that you remove the labels because they don't taste good and they don't zest well. And I'm going to give it a little rinse here and then give it a dry because that'll make it easier to use. And either one, I can use the one that I just used, but I want to show you. So what some people like to do is they like to hold it and just run the fruit against it over a bowl. It comes out on the back. That's what you need to know because people are like, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, and nothing's happening. So it comes out on the back. Or the other thing that I much prefer to do is to hold this still and do it this way rather than up and down. So anyway, this is the zest of lemon and it can be the zest of lime. 
I do not use the zest of grapefruit, but I do use the zest of, or, of orange. So this lemon right here, as interesting as it was to me, gave me, I need a quarter cup of uh, lemon juice for the, orange, for the lemon scented spinach spread. It gave me a quarter cup, one lemon. I find it unusual, but it was a large lemon. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'll just put this aside because I want to move along to the cauliflower. So if you're trying to pay attention to how many carbs you get, if you have a, some kind of restriction and you're thinking, oh yeah, you know, every time I eat mashed potatoes, I don't feel that well or my blood sugar goes up, then a good alternative is cauliflower. And cauliflower is a really low calorie cruciferous vegetable. And um, what you wanna do with your cauliflower is you wanna break it into florets. And I've done that. You know, you want them all about the same size. They don't need to be exactly the same size. So I'm gonna put this into the pressure cooker. You can do this easily in a pan on the stove. My stove is kind of busy right now. So I'm gonna put this in here. And I would say this is a good three to four cups. I am going to add whatever it says in the recipe, which is garlic, because I love garlic. So three cloves of garlic minced. And you don't have to mince it so fine because this is going to get mashed. But what I wanna show you is this is a large clove of garlic. If you're using one like this, I would count this as two unless you really love garlic. And a lot of people really love garlic. So it's okay to put in more because when garlic is cooked, it's not the same as when it's not cooked. So I'm gonna put that one in and I'm gonna put in a little bit more. I'm gonna use my vegetable broth that I made because I have it. And so it's a pretty simple recipe. So it's a quarter cup of vegetable stock. I may need a little bit more, but I am not sure about that. So let me do this and get, well, that's a one cup measure. So what I'm gonna do is put in a quarter of that exactly. I'm actually gonna do just a little more. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna turn that on. And I'm gonna cook this for three minutes under pressure. So for those of you who don't use a pressure cooker, you're gonna wanna cook it until you can get a knife into the cauliflower really easily. That's gonna be the key for you. So this is gonna be for three minutes um, at regular pressure. So that's that. And I will um, quick release the pressure on this. This one, I'm just gonna let go for the squash. And then I'm gonna tell you about some of the other things I'm gonna do because I do wanna say five recipes in an hour is tends to be a lot, but that's okay. So let me do what I'm gonna do with this um, cauliflower. I have something that's so much fun is I am going to mash with my masher and um, that's gonna work really well. Or my other option, and I'm gonna do this with the soup once I go get it, is I'm gonna use an immersion blender. So I think at this moment, just pretend I'm still here talking and I'll be right back. All right, this is a perfect opportunity for me to let everybody know that if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat box and we'll make sure to answer them throughout the presentation. And the recipes for everything Jill is doing today is also on um, the chat box. I pasted the link to our website where you could find those. Perfect. So here's my immersion blender. If you don't have one of these, that's okay. You can use a regular blender. I do want to tell you how important it is though. If you put hot liquids into your blender, it's very, very important. I taught for 30 years at the junior college and I saw this fairly often. Do not just put hot liquids in your blender, put the lid on and more than once I have this happen in the kitchen, the whole thing will blow off. It's not a pretty thing. So what you want to do is you want to fill it half full you put a piece of plastic on the top of the blender, put the lid on and blend it. If you have to blend in batches, it's way better than cleaning the ceiling and the cabinets and everything else. 
So just keep that in mind because that's not what you want to happen. Works really badly um, to have that happen. In here at the end, what I'm gonna put is I'm gonna put plant milk and you can put regular milk. I'm gonna put plant milk and I'm gonna put some uh, plant butter, but you can use any butter. And the reason for this, and you don't have to put any of this in if you don't want, you can just mash it. Um, the reason that I do that is because you may want a little more fat in your meal. There's none in the soup. And if you want a little more fat, this is a good place to put it because this is a very light dish. And pretty much everything I'm going to show you is going to be pretty light. So if you're going to, you know, there's a little coconut water, coconut milk in here. Coconut water is light. Coconut milk is not. So you decide. Um, and this is not your everyday meal, but you can eat these recipes and use them every single day. So I'm going to put plant milk in and plant butter when that is ready. So let me tell you about upcoming. So this is my spice grinder here. Some people know it as a coffee grinder. I use the spice grinder to grind. Oh, it smells so good. I, I want to move into that spice grinder because it smells so good. Um, okay. So I ground some allspice berries. These are these. Just looks like another spice. Smells really good. My sister sent me some that somebody brought back from Turkey. And this is cardamom. And um, I really, if you've never used cardamom, I just read something interesting about cardamom, which that it's really good for your heart. It's probably good for everybody. So cardamom comes in a little pod. And when you open that pod, there's these little seeds in there and they're kind of weird looking. I'm hoping I can show them to you. They're not that easy to see on camera, but I put them in my spice grinder and I ground them. And people always say, well, why can't I just use ground cardamom? And you can, however, one of the things about um, some spices when they're ground and cardamom is one of them is it has a lot of oil in it. And the moment you grind it, it starts losing some of that oil and losing some of that flavor. So this one happens to have very little, the seeds, probably not gonna get a good shot, but the seeds are kind of lighter. Sometimes they are darker, but they're there and sometimes they're black. But anyway, so that's cardamom and I really like to use it. I love the flavor of it. My husband hates the flavor of it. So, oh, well, um, he still eats the soup. And I have to tell you about this soup a little bit. So I make squash soup in many, many different ways. And I've been serving it at Thanksgiving probably for about 15 years. The first year I brought squash soup to Thanksgiving, people were like, oh, okay, you know, nobody ate it except me. Um, and I almost always bring food to Thanksgiving so I can be sure that I eat what I want to eat. So um, <laughs> nobody ate the squash soup. The second year, I think people tasted it. And now all these years later, it's like, are you bringing the squash soup? Because now people really want the squash soup. And I think one year recently, I was like, I'm not bringing squash soup. And they're like, what? So anyway, these dishes that I'm making are part of our, now the standard um, repertoire. The one that I didn't do is a maple mustard Brussels sprouts, which now people want, but they didn't always. So the squash soup in some form is almost always on, at Thanksgiving. Um, the next dish I'm going to show you is a wild rice dish. And this wild rice dish is something that, again, I was like, oh, I'm not going to make wild rice. What? You're not making wild rice. I'm like, okay, I'll make wild rice. So let me talk a little bit about wild rice. Jill, can I, can I have a question answered from a viewer? Absolutely. You can okay. ask me a question anytime. Okay, perfect. We have somebody asking, what did you put the cardamom and allspice to? Was it the soup or the mashed potatoes? 
didn't put it anywhere yet. That's a great question. Thank you for paying attention. I'm going to be putting those into the wild rice that I'm doing. Um, but the cardamom is going to go into some into the uh, squash soup. I think uh, just a pinch of it is going in the squash soup. Um, but most of it is going into, yeah, a pinch of freshly ground cardamom. Um, but most of it is going into the wild rice. So thank you for paying attention and keeping me on my toes. So this is cultivated wild rice. Real wild rice is much more expensive than the cultivated wild rice. And um, I did something interesting today. I cooked the wild rice in advance. And I have to tell you, I made less than the recipe because the difference in Zoom classes and live classes is at the end, I have all the food and I didn't want like massive amounts of food. So not that it's not delicious, but you know, I can only eat wild rice so many times. And people often don't buy wild rice because they're like, it's too expensive. So what I want to tell you about wild rice is that um, it is not really a rice, it's a cultivated grass. And so it's a little lighter in terms of um, calories and so on. So it's a good thing to have. I just saw at Surf Market that they had the brown and wild rice mix. It's interesting because they charge $5.99 a pound. I believe if you buy uh, just brown rice is about $2.99. So if you took some wild rice and threw it into your brown rice, you'd probably get more wild rice. So you're paying for the wild rice being added. I like to cook wild rice on its own. So I'm gonna show you what I cooked um, already because I have it here. Some lentils. I was very pleased with how the wild rice turned out. And this has another step, which I'm gonna do somewhere uh, with the apples. And so anyway, this is the wild rice. It's cooked. I did have to drain it a little bit. Um, I usually cook it, I cooked it two to one. So that means I added two cups of liquid for one cup of, a little more than two cups for one cup of rice. I only cooked a half a cup and you can see how much it made. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind is how much you're getting from just a half a cup of rice. So this expands quite a bit more than regular rice. Um, so anyway, that was, I cooked the wild rice and now I see that I, I had a plan, I still have a plan, but this plan has just changed just a little bit because I was like, I know there's one more thing to cook and that is the, um, apples and such for the wild rice, which I'm going to cook. I just need to do a little rearrangement here, which I will do because I was going to cook the mushrooms over here. I am going to do, but let's just give this a little break. So all right, so here's my mushrooms. Here's my pan for my apples and such. Um, so let me switch to that because sometimes this can get confusing as in what's in this pot, what's in that pot, and what is she doing? So I want to make sure that you know what I'm doing and that I know what I'm doing. So I have my wild rice and I've already cooked it. So the wild rice and water, that part's already done. So the apples I have already cut up. And so I have the cut up apples. These are in lemon water and they look really good actually. I tried to just shove those other ones in. They didn't look so good. So use a bigger bowl. Um, so let me see. So when the, when the rice is done, I'm gonna keep it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat this and I'm gonna saute the apples, the almonds and the pumpkin seeds. And I wanna tell you what I've already done so you know. My stove sometimes is a little finicky. So let me, let me get it so that it's happy. There we go. All right. So I'm gonna put the apples, I'm gonna pull them out of the water and I'm gonna put them into the pan. And 
And I already toasted the almonds and I want to talk a little bit about how I toasted them and what they are. And you can use any nuts that you want for this. I happen to like almonds. These are called sliced almonds. Let me make sure. I always get this ter these terms mixed up. I like put them away. Grab them. Here they are. They are called sliced almonds. And you can also buy slivered almonds. So let me show you the almonds so that you know what they are. They look like this. Gonna get taller one day. Um, so anyway, they are sliced. I already toasted them, so I don't have to put them in with the apples. Could And the pumpkin seeds, I have some choices here. These pumpkin seeds have not been toasted and these are just regular pumpkin seeds. And I want to show you the difference because I think it's really interesting. So these are just regular pumpkin seeds. And then the other pumpkin seeds that I bought, and you may not know this, but there's more than one type of pumpkin seeds. I only know this because I've seen the pumpkins. These other pumpkin seeds, I wish I had a dog because boy, I got good eating on the floor here, um, are roasted and unsalted pumpkin seeds. And you can see there's a huge difference between these pumpkin seeds, like just in the size of the seed. So I don't know that you can really see that. Turn the camera down so that you can maybe see. Can you see these are the ones that I bought? These are the ones that I have. So these are much larger seeds. So they are already roasted. So I don't know that I need to roast them, but I'm gonna put them in the pan anyway, because I have them here. Okay, so that's going in and I'm gonna add my spices. But remember the almonds are already toasted. So I don't need to add those. I could if I wanted. And what I also have here is I have um, my spices, my cardamom, my cinnamon, which I didn't tell you, and cinnamon helps lower blood sugar, add it to as many things as you can. I have some dried cranberries that I soak that I'm gonna take out. Um, and so these have already been soaking and I'm gonna pull them out of the water. And I'm gonna put them in the pan along with the spices. And I'm going to grab my, my something here, which is right in front of me. I have to say things are smelling quite good right at the moment. Um, so let me get the spices in because then they'll smell, smell even better. So I have my allspice and I have cardamom and I'm going to save a little bit of that for the soup. pinch. I've got a pinch there. Um, cinnamon. And this calls for, oh, what, oh, and nutmeg. Oh, now th this is always the challenge for me. Where did I put the nutmeg? And I do have a nutmeg and my grater. So I was like, oh, I'm sure that I'll have my nutmeg. But once I put it down, here it is. Sometimes so, it just disappears. Um, we yeah. have somebody wondering from, from the registered dietitian that you are, um, should a person avoid cinnamon if they have low blood sugar? Um, generally, I do not believe so. I still think you should have cinnamon because cinnamon is still really good for you. And I think you know, with something natural like um, cinnamon, I think what it does is it helps regulate blood sugar, but I don't think it's going to make it too low especially if you have other food. If you have not ever grated a nutmeg, buy whole nutmegs and get yourself a grater. It can be a nutmeg grater, but you really want to grate it. It has so much more flavor. I used to think that I hated nutmeg until I started grating it myself. So 
you find that little jar, that's where it lives. And make sure I got everything. Oh, and you know what else goes in here is black pepper. So I have some black pepper I'm going to put in. And I think I'm going to turn this off. I added a little liquid from the cranberries because it was getting kind of dark. And that's not what I'm looking for here. Let me just toss that around. And then I'm going to add the wild rice to it. Let me get the pepper in. And if you like pepper, you definitely want to grate it. I mean, grind it because it's going to taste much better. All right. And then I'm going to add the wild rice to this. So here is my wild rice ready to go. And if you're only having like four people for Thanksgiving, don't make the whole recipe. This isn't one of those recipes that freezes really, really well. So I wouldn't make the whole thing. I'd probably just make, you know, a half of it or a third of it. And if you really love dried fruit, just be aware that it is very high in natural sugar. So you want to limit how much if you wanted to add some fresh cranberries to this or some uh, pomegranate arrows, you could do that. And then I'm going to add the toasted almonds to this. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like because I have a bowl for it. I have to say, I don't know what it tastes like, but it, it looks real. It tastes, smells really good. Smells really good. So get the bowl and the pot holder. So here we go. You can, if you want, put parsley on here. Um, if you want to add a little green, but I might actually sprinkle some of the unsoaked cranberries in here. You could give it a squeeze of lemons if you like. Um, that would be good. If you wanted it not to just be all sweet, you could add a drizzle of um, vinegar would be good a little balsamic vinegar, and I'm going to hold it up so you can get a get a sense of it. But it is something that it lasts for a few days, a number, of, well, it doesn't ever last for me, but um, for a lot of people, this would last for a number of days. And then what you can do is you can eat it over time, but um, I've never had it go bad and I've never frozen it. It's not like a really great, let's freeze this recipe. So let me show you. So if you can maybe see the cranberries in there. So there's the cranberries, the apples, um, the almonds. And so, yeah, you're not eating it. So I'm, I'm sticking my fingers in there. It's quite delicious. And you can adjust the seasonings. And one of the things you may notice is I did not add any salt. And that is because I prefer to salt my food after rather than salt it when I'm cooking it. So here we go. Here is the cauliflower. I'm just releasing the pressure on it. So that's what's happening here. And just so, to let you know, cauliflower and nutmeg often go well. So, but I'm not going to add any to this, even though I have it right here. So I'm going to turn my pressure cooker off. And for people who have nut allergies, can you suggest an alternative or just leave it out altogether, the almonds for the rice um, dish? For the, for the rice? Yeah. Yeah, I would just use more seeds. I'd put in sunflower seeds, maybe some sesame seeds. I would just not even worry about it and just put in the seeds. You don't have to add nuts. So here is, this is way hot. Um, so what I'm gonna do, well, I think I'm gonna leave it in there. I know that it's quite soft. Oh yeah, 
And you know, I have to tell you, I there was an ingredient that I forgot to add that I could I have choices here. Now I can take this out because I wanted to show you the other ingredient and I forgot to show you. Not that this has ever happened to you at home, but if it did, um, let me show you what I can do here because I want to show you this other ingredient because it's so ugly that often people will be like, I don't want that. Um, and you have two choices, three choices, but I may just go with what I already made because it's here. But I want to show you what I recommend adding. And you could, if you really want to, you could add potatoes when you're cooking this. If you're like, oh, cauliflower, nah, it's not going to cut it. It's not potatoes. No, it's not potatoes. And it's not supposed to be potatoes. But if you really want to feel like it's potatoes, you could add a small potato to this. There's nothing wrong with eating potatoes. Um, you just may not want all potatoes, especially if they raise your blood sugar. So I'm gonna finish mashing this, but let me show you the other ingredient. Okay. Okay, so there's two ingredients here. I won't ask you, but if I was in a class, I would hold this up and I say, would anybody know what this is? This is a rutabaga. This is a celery root. And what I want to tell you about the celery root is that you don't use the top and it doesn't taste like celery on the top. It kind of tastes like celery on the bottom. This whole brown part needs to come up. So it needs a lot of peeling. The rutabaga is a cruciferous vegetable just like the cauliflower. And so it can be cooked with it. It is hard and it needs to get cut up smaller than the cauliflower because it won't mash as well. The celery root is also hard and it needs to get cut up and put into smaller pieces, but it tastes like celery. So these would be good additions. You could use turnips if you like, but either one of these, and I'm so sorry I forgot, but this is life in my kitchen. Um, so anyway, what I want you to see here is how easy this is to mash. I mean, I'm just using a masher. This is like way easier than mashed potatoes, I can tell you that. So what I wanna to add to this is I wanna add a little bit of plant milk and I'm gonna use oat. You can use what you have. You can use regular milk if you want. But first I'm gonna add a little bit of the butter because it will work better to do the butter first because it will still be really hot. So I'm gonna put in maybe a teaspoon or two, I'm not gonna put in that much, um, but a couple of teaspoons there. And it, when you have something, when you have a meal like this, you do wanna probably add something with a little fat just to help even things out for your blood sugar. So there's that. And I really don't need much plant milk because it's pretty loose already. I'm adding it more for flavor. And then I'm gonna just add a little salt and a little pepper. I'm gonna add just a couple of tablespoons of plant milk. I'm gonna get a fork. Yeah, that'll be perfect. A little salt and a little pepper. And then, and then I'm going to taste it so that I can tell you how it is. Pepper. And if you have white pepper and you don't like seeing, oh my, seeing the black flakes, then just use white pepper. Okay. Now I really need the dog. Um, here we go. Well, that's really tasty. <laughs> Very tasty. It's not so beautiful, but it's definitely tasty. I can tell you that. So that's going to go away. All right. Next up. Oh, squash soup. Let's see. Nope, it's still under pressure. I'm gonna 
I'm going to leave it for a little bit so that I have a little more time to deal with some other things. So this, excuse me, this next recipe is for uh, lentil walnut pate. And it's very easy to make. If you've never cooked lentils, they're very easy to cook. They're the quickest cooking bean that you can have. So I highly recommend that you think about it. Um, I have a leak here. And I know that Chef Rebecca last week talked about cleaning leaks. It is incredibly important. I left part of the leak unclean so you could see. Anywhere this leak comes out of the ground, like right there, it has dirt. So you really want to, like right here, right here at the top. I don't know if you can see that dirt really well, but it has dirt. So you don't want the dirty part in your food. And you can take it, you can soak it. But what I like to do is cut it down the middle, open the leaves, and then, um, and then uh, rinse it because I find that works best. So I am going to just cut the center of the leek. Now in French cooking, you don't use the green part. People often ask why and this still needs to be clean. Why don't you use the green part? Because they like it to be white. So that's the reason. Not because there's anything wrong with it. The whole part of the vegetable is edible. And I'm gonna grab that back for a second because I wanna show you something. If you look at the top of the leek that you buy in the store, you'll see they're all flat like this. Sometimes the leaves are another foot or two. If you go to the farmer's market and they have this, what I encourage you to do with the long leaves, buy it, you can cut it off here. Those leaves will become part of your stock. So this is the beginning of my stock the next time I make it. So I like to make scrap stock. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut the leek and I'm going to cook it with some mushrooms. And I have some mushrooms that I've soaked and I'm just gonna get that cooked and I'm gonna show you how I made the pate. And then I just have to finish the squash soup and here we go. So. Jill, just a couple quick questions came through. Yeah. Um, would you add garlic to the cauliflower like you might in mashed potatoes? When you do? Um, they're Say asking, would you, would you add garlic add to the garlic? cauliflower? I did add garlic. Um, okay. And you can, you have a choice with the garlic. You can add it at the beginning when you're cooking the cauliflower and you can also add it at the end if you want it to be really garlicky. Either way. Perfect. And then we'll, the next will work. The next question is, do you need to peel rutabaga too or can you add it with the peel on? That is a great question. Yes, you need to peel a rutabaga. It's just not quite as ugly as the celery root. But they tend to, I'll, I'll show you, they tend to be kind of tough. So you definitely want to peel it. You can do it with a knife or you can do it with a vegetable peeler if you have a good peeler. This one is very bad. Let me grab another one. It's the good part of having many of them because that one, I know where that one's going. Trash. Um, anyway, so what you can see is that I'm just peeling it. It does have not a very thick peel, but a thick enough peel that you wouldn't want to eat it. Um, and it will change during the season. Rutabaga is a winter vegetable. So a fall and winter vegetable. And it is cruciferous. So it will match the cauliflower somewhat. So, but no, celery root, it gives you a hint. So here's a, an important thing. I'm glad I did that. Is that this, the peel of the rutabaga does not go into the stock because I don't put cruciferous vegetables into my stock. So that will not go in there. This will go into the compost. Okay, so I have my um, here. 
I shall look at the rest of my leek. Um, I have some wild mushrooms that I have soaked. And I wanna show you, you can use any kind of wild mushrooms. You could do shiitake mushrooms. What I have is, and it's just the beginning of mushroom season. I have black trump, dried black trumpet mushrooms and I'll show them to you. They're very, very flavorful. And they look like little trumpets when you see them. They look like flowers actually. And this is one of my favorite mushrooms to harvest. And I have some that I have harvested, but in the interest of showing you what they look like when you buy them, I bought those. So anyway, I'm gonna cut these up and I'm going to put them in the pan along with some carmini mushrooms. And you may wanna know why am I using both? And the answer is because carmini mushrooms are much less expensive than black trumpet mushrooms. And so I cut up some carmini mushrooms. Those are going in. I did half the recipe. I'm gonna show you the lentils. So those will go in. If I need more liquid, I can use this lovely soaking water to add some liquid because that may be necessary. And you can put in as many mushrooms as you want or as few as you want. One of the things I almost always do is trim the end of the mushroom just because it's been sitting around. This goes into my stock for later. And one of the things about mushrooms is they should not be slimy. They should be firm. And I will say that in you don't want to store them in plastic, even though you often find them that way at the store, does not make them better. So there's that. Um, what I'm going to add to that at some point, or maybe not, because I already have one I've done, is lentils that I cooked. So this is about two thirds of the lentils that I cooked and they are fully cooked. They are called, I'm gonna show them to you. They are, they're called something different in different places. So these are called whole green lentils. Sometimes they're called brown lentils. There are many different kinds of lentils and these are just one of them, but they generally look, I wanna show you what they look like and they sometimes will look a little different. These are small. And so um, let's see if I can get this so you can really see them. So those are small, but they are brown or green lentils. And that's what they look like. This is what they look like when they are cooked. These are fully cooked. And they you can freeze them if you're not going to use them, but they're going to go in with these mushrooms. So I think what I'm gonna do in the interest of time, because I do wanna finish the soup, is I'm gonna show you what I have already done rather than cooking this. I have some garlic that I'm adding here and I'll show you the pate I already finished because I do wanna get to the spinach dip um, and finish the soup. So what I have here, is I have the pate that I already made. It does need to be chilled so that that works. Oh, I just discovered something. Don't put your dish in the lid. The pressure cooker. Okay, so the important thing when you're making the pate is to follow the directions. That gets cooked. It's important to have it thoroughly cooked and then it goes in the food processor with the lentils and some oats. And it says oat flour. I like to use whole oats. So what I have here is I have a dish that I have lined with parchment paper. And hopefully, if the world is spinning correctly today, when I turn this over, it will come out very beautifully. If not, who knows? Okay. It did. So I all is right in my world right now. So this is what it looks like. What you do is on the bottom, you put some parsley and you put walnuts so that you have something that looks good. And then 
and get one of my cute little knives here. Then what you do is you serve it with some crackers, but I'll just taste it. Mm. Um, you put balsamic vinegar in there. So, I mean, it's really delicious. One of the things that I can tell you about this, it freezes really well. So this is like the smallest that I, I don't have a dish smaller than this, but that freezes really well and it's really good. So back to the soup and then I'm gonna blend up that spinach dip for you. So this is now ready to go. Oh, it's hot too. And if you don't love mushrooms and if you do love mushrooms, definitely make the, um, definitely make the pate because it's really delicious and mushrooms are a super food. They are su super good for you. Okay. So I'm putting in the pinch of cardamom. I am getting my immersion blender, plugging that in. And I'm going to blend. The important thing when using an immersion blender is to not lift it out of what you're blending. <laughs> And you can do it as chunky as you want or not chunky as you want. It will be fine either way. If you love ginger, add ginger to this. That makes it really, really good. And This is the time at which you can add the coconut milk if you want. I think I'm going to leave it uncoconut milk. And I'm going to put it in a bowl. Okay, Jill, someone's asking if you can suggest what to store mushrooms in, if not plastic. A paper bag is good, even though they will dry out. But uh, a paper bag will work much better or put holes in your plastic so that they can breathe. They are more like human beings than anything. And so you want to treat them like that. They need to be able to breathe. So here is the, you, here's another thing you could do with this soup. If you didn't want to add the coconut milk to it, you can make, use coconut cream and drizzle it on top, which would be, oh, that's quite tasty, I must say. Um, and I would put cilantro on here because I love cilantro. You could put pumpkin seeds on it if you want, but it's smelling really, really good. Okay, the last dish is gonna be a little noisy. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what's in it and how I'm doing it. And it's a lemon scented spinach spread. So let me add dip. Let me make sure I get everything in there because I am often very good at forgetting all of the ingredients. So I have my, um, now calls for a 10 ounce package. This is a 16 ounce bag. And what I've done is mostly drain all of the liquid out of it, which is what you want to do. The main ingredient in this is a silken tofu. And so um, if you can get a low fat one, if you want it, that's fine. It's in the box. So you don't really have to be concerned about how long they're gonna last because they really do last pretty much forever. So this is, these are going into my emergency storage food um, along with a pair of scissors because the scissors are a great way to open it. So, the longer they sit, sometimes the more liquid they have. And 
I'm going to just pour out any liquid that's in there and I'm going to use half of this and it's going to go in here. But what I'm going to do first, because I want this really blended up is I'm putting in my green onions and I'm going to process those. Okay, then I'm going to add my tofu, half the package, and the equivalent of 10 ounces of frozen spinach, the lemon juice, the lemon zest, about right. And you know, if you ever cook spinach, you know how much it shrinks down. So if you want more spinach, you can add more spinach. So I have my lemon zest and my lemon juice. And I'm gonna add half the lemon juice and half the lemon zest. And sometimes I add um, sweetener to this if I find it too tart. If you have Meyer lemons and you live near me, let me know, because I love Meyer lemons and I'd be happy to take some off your hands. So this needs just probably a little bit of pepper and maybe a little bit of salt. Um, oh, Dijon mustard, which I did take out to put in. So let me find this. Now I always tell people when you're at home and you're not doing five things at once, you'd probably be able to find your ingredients much better than I can. So just know where you put them because that will help you. Um, so I'm gonna put in a couple of teaspoons. I love mustard, which is funny because growing up I hated mustard. And it turns out I don't hate mustard. I hate yellow mustard. And I still hate to this day. I do not like yellow mustard. In fact, I can't stand the stuff. The smell of it makes me sick. Sure, there's nothing else. Salt and pepper, and then just a little sweetener if I want it. Jill, earlier you had used. Instead of. Go ahead. Sorry, um, you had used uh, walnuts in one of your dishes and um, yep. a participant is asking, would it be a good substitute to use seeds and would it still taste good? It will still taste good. Um, are you talking about the uh, pate? Um, I was, I, I'm not sure. I'm waiting for a response okay. from the participant. So, um, um, if it's for the pate, yes, it will still taste good, but there's two places where it is that it's in the recipe and it's on the bottom. So whatever seeds you choose and you could use a combination, put it in both places. It won't have the same texture, but it will still be quite tasty. Um, so I would use them there if you can't eat nuts. Okay, let's see. Perfect. And and the next one was, um, would you add fresh or powdered ginger to the soup that you made? I would probably add fresh because I love fresh ginger. Um, and I have to say, this doesn't taste too tart to me. It tastes quite delicious. So this is something you could serve with vegetables. What If it's left over, you can spread it on your tortillas and make wraps with it. It's very tasty. And this is what you use instead of the spinach dip that you make with the mayonnaise and the sour cream and other things like that. And it's, you know, yes, if you're serving it to anyone, they would be like, oh, it's not the same. And you're like, okay, it's not the same. It's not supposed to be the same, but it is quite tasty and it is very delicious. So, um, and I would probably put in a teaspoon or two of ginger and what I would do is I'd use one of my graters 
and I just grate it into there. So I think I made everything and a big mess. So that means that everything was quite successful here. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I'm happy to answer them about anything I made or anything Thanksgiving or. I'd like to invite anybody who has questions to unmute their speaker and ask. Um, please be curious though, if there's another person who's speaking, keep your um, speaker unmuted or keep it muted if somebody else is speaking. All right, I just want to let everybody know one more time that these recipes are available on Mendonoma Health Alliance's website. Um, I put the link to the recipes on um, the chat box. I also want to let you know that they are downloadable and printable if you um, find them on our website. And I look forward to next week when I'm talking about uh, nutrition for diabetes and gut health because it's a favorite subject of mine. So. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Jill. Our, our week five edition of our education series for diabetes will take place on Wednesday next week at 5.30. And, um, and the Zoom link for that is available on Mendonoma Health Alliance's website as well. It's also available on our Facebook page and um, if anybody's interested, they can't find the link or they're having a hard time making it clickable or finding a clickable link, you're welcome to email us and we can send you the link directly through email. My email um, is info at mendonomahealth.org. And, um, and go ahead. Micheline, can I add that also you have videos on the videos that are already done on YouTube so people can go there and look for them? Absolutely, yeah. So we do have a YouTube page of all our, our all of our past presentations. If you just go to youtube.com and search Mendonoma Health Alliance, you'll find our page with all of the pre the recorded series from the past. And we invite you to do that. Take advantage of it. They'll be up there forever. All right. I like forever. Thank you. Very yeah. much. <laughs> so um, if, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to say thank you very much, Jill, for your time tonight. Very valuable information. And I hope everybody gets a chance to make these dishes at home. Bye, everyone. <laughs>